Your Honor. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Scott from The Sun. Thanks for coming to tonight's debate featuring six candidates for school committee. We'll go 40 minutes tonight, and then we'll have about five or six minutes to give a one-minute closing statement. And then the second group of candidates will come in under the same rules. Uh, candidates will have one minute to respond. Uh, my editor, Jim Campanini, is the esteemed timekeeper this evening. And should another candidate wish to get his or her opinion in, beyond the one minute um, allotment, we'll consider that and likely grant that wish. So without further ado, we'll get right to the questions. We're going in alphabetical order tonight, everyone. So we'll start with candidate um, for election, Andy Dakota. Andy, in light of what recently happened at the high school concerning the racially motivated texting and Instagram issue, do you believe there should be an, an initiative throughout the school department to hire more people of color on the administrative and teaching staffs. Having more people of color wouldn't necessarily solve the issue that was raised. Um, and to um, say that that would be the cure-all, I think that it would probably be of some help. But I think in terms of um, any kind of racial issue, I mean, there are racial issues throughout the city, throughout the United States, for that matter. And to, um, I'm not trying to downplay what took place, but I think we have to step back and perhaps use this as a good teaching tool uh, to work with the kids and have them learn um, consequences of, of, of making statements and social media and how intensive of, a, of a reaction it can have on a lot of people. All right, thank you. Same Steve Judron, one thank of you. two incumbents seeking re-election this fall. Yes. Thank you, Chris. So regardless of any incident, I think we have a very diverse school and I think we should strive to have a diverse uh, administration and diverse teachers. I think we do that and I think you know, that's something we need to continually focus on. Twenty years ago, I initiated a program here in Lowell called Spindle City Corps. Uh, I was uh, founder of the organization, nonprofit organization here in the city, and was the president of it for ten years. And the, the focus behind that group was service, education, and diversity. We did service all across the community. Uh, we uh, did education once a week for the kids, and the diversity component, I think, was the most important because what we did is we took kids from all different backgrounds, racial groups, uh, economic strata uh, in Lowell, mostly from Lowell High School, and we put them together on working teams uh, throughout the summer. And it was amazing the transformation that would happen. Because I think what can happen sometimes is even here at Lowell High School with a very diverse community, you can have um, you know, a diverse community as a whole, but those kids never mingle, never really get to know each other, never really get to understand each other. So I think having more programs like that here in the city, maybe we can work on instituting something like that here at Lowell High School uh, in, in my next term. A Spindle City Corps actually still exists as a program of CTI, so maybe we can, uh, we can resurrect it and uh, in, in inject more high school kids in it to, uh, to uh, address that. Thank you, Steve. Candidate Gignac. Thank you for the question. I do believe that there's a lack of diversity in, in leadership across the district. Um, I don't necessarily believe it's the school committee's role to, 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 to get involved in the hiring of anybody other than the superintendent. And it's the superintendent's job to really make sure that the building principals, the other administrators, are hiring the best possible person for the job. I would like to see a more diverse uh, workforce, but I, I wouldn't necessarily get involved in, in who's hiring both. Candidate Hoey. Thank you. Um, when you say we have to hire diverse help, I, I feel I was hit back in the early 70s with um, what they call affirmative action. And right now our Supreme Court is looking into it to see if the playing field is level. Uh, I believe we should just hire the best people at whatever position we're hiring. And it doesn't have to be of color. It just has to be the best person. Thank you very much. Candidate Lay. Um, I believe uh, the same as Mr. Hoy uh, that we should hire the best. However, I know that the school has been uh, making that the mission that our staff should be 
uh, more diverse and uh, I would support it if we have a, a, a staff who is um, the most qualified who are minorities. Thank you. And Dennis Mercier, what are your thoughts on that topic? Well, I think the, uh, the entire city of Lowell School and the school department, the school kids were very uh, diversified. Uh, whether uh, I'll echo uh, Mr. Dakota that uh, I don't think a, a positive, diverse uh, staff is actually the cure all. We should be uh, doing more education. It was a very unfortunate incident. I think it was one incident. I really don't think there's a, there's a major uh, race issue in the school department today. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll go to candidate Gendron uh, to start the second round. If someone can hand him the mic, please. Steve, if the school committee strives for stability, why can't it seem to keep a superintendent more than about three years? Now that's an excellent question. You know, in my I'm looking uh, for an excellent answer. Uh, I'm going to try to provide that for you. Uh, in my term uh, here in uh, on the school committee, my single term, uh, I have uh, driven for stability. That's been my uh, I've said that many nights on the school committee floor. We need stability here. Uh, that's why I supported uh, renewing Gene Franco's contract. Uh, that's why I uh, supported um, Assistant Superintendent Lang because I felt like once Gene was gone, that would provide us some level of stability. That said, I'm quite satisfied with uh, Dr. Calfali. I think he's doing an excellent job, and I believe that uh, he's a person that could probably break that three-year barrier, Chris. And I'm going to support him and um, you know hopefully uh, drive him beyond that goal line. Can I take back? Thank you. I'm, I'm hopeful that the instability is a thing of the past, and I'm, I'm hoping to join a committee that's going to be supportive of the new superintendent, work together with him and his administration to really develop a plan uh, to better the entire district, and I'm hopeful that he'll be here for a very long time, and I, I will absolutely support him in his effort. Okay, I'd like to just stick, um, we have a question coming up about the new superintendent. Talk sure. about the, co the school committees of the past. Why have they been unable to keep a superintendent more than two or three years? That's the question. This isn't a question about how far we at this point. Right, well, I, I, I served on, on the committee for two years, and during that time, we were very, we were pretty stable, and we supported the superintendent. I had not been involved in a committee that was not supportive of the superintendent, but I think what has taken over is personal politics, and I think that is, is really taken the focus off of the education and the focus off the children. I think personal politics, politics is... Can you elaborate on that? I think it's, it's pretty clear that politics has taken over the school system. Okay, I agree. Thank you again. I agree totally. Uh, I just feel like even if you're a state rep, city council, uh, even school committee, what, what it is is people are all looking for jobs. They drive every state rep crazy. That's what that every day they receive calls, just get me a job. Can you get me a job? And the same thing happened to these people that we just lost. You can't get them a job, get rid of them. You can't, that's not our job. Our job is, and I was on the school committee, our job is to let the superintendent do his, his job without micromanaging and being in his office worrying about, can I get my friend this job, please? And that's what's ruining it, I think. That's my opinion, thank you. Can I lay? As uh, someone outside looking in, I only could tell that if we had a contract for the superintendent, that might help. Thank you. Dennis Mercier? I think that it, it is right. It's been a revolving door for superintendents. Uh, as far as, uh, it's a tough, the next one question, but I don't have an excellent answer because we weren't part of the committee at the time. It was going on, it, you know, there could have been uh, politics. Uh, there could have been some micromanaging going on. What needs to be done is to, uh, get behind the superintendent, support him, and hopefully we know we have a good long term with the superintendent. Let's just stay on this topic for a minute based on something you said, candidate Hoey, about the nepotism, about the, the jaws for friends and stuff. The school committee recently passed an anti-nepotism policy. It wasn't, wasn't un a unanimous vote. How do you all feel quickly about that policy and do you want to see that policy stay on the books? Uh, nepotism can be a negative or a positive, depending on how you look at it. I think uh, it's one thing to get a job for someone. It's, some, it's up to that person to prove that they're qualified for that position and follow through with 
doing the job. If you don't do the job, then they shouldn't keep you, regardless of who got you the job or how you got the job. So uh, I, I think uh, nepotism can be good and it can be bad as well. But what about the policy passed by the school by the school committee? I don't know what that policy is. And, and how strictly did Mr. Gender can probably give us clarified man sitting to your left camp? I, I didn't support the uh, the change to the nepotism policy because I think we should hire the best person for the job, no matter who they're related to. Or you know, we should find the best person, hire the best person. If they happen to be related to somebody who's on the school committee or who's uh, in the administration, I don't think it should matter. I think we we should uh, seek the best person. There is already a. a a policy that's in Massachusetts general laws that says if somebody's being hired that's related to an administrator, there's certain steps you have to take uh, to make that public. So it's, you're not trying to do anything behind somebody's back, um, but a policy that eliminates uh, anybody who happens to be related to a school committee person from being uh, an employee is ridiculous. Uh, Andy, if you had a, a grandson or a son uh, who wanted to be a teacher um, and you're on the school committee, could do it. If he was fully qualified, had a master's degree, the whole bit, it couldn't happen. And I think that's wrong. I think this is uh, a low community. Um, we're a very tight community. Um, and I think that if somebody um, is qualified for a job, they should have it. I, I support hiring low people uh, for, for working in, in the school department if we can. You know, if we have uh, people who are vying for a position and they're, everything else is equal, one happens to be from Lowell, I think we should hire that person. If they happen to be, re be related to somebody, I don't think it should matter. Kennedy, thank you. Uh, I, if I was on the committee at the time, I would not have supported the, uh, the policy that's in place now. Uh, Lowell is fortunate enough to have generations and generations of families that are educators and that are a part of the system. With this policy, that's over. It's done. I, I, I agree with Mr. Gendron that the disclosure that is mandated by the state is the appropriate way to go. But again, school committee members should not be getting, getting involved in the hiring of anyone other than the superintendent. If the superintendent is hiring the wrong people, then it's the school committee's responsibility to step in. Um, I just say with nepotism, I agree with them. I think you can get the best people sometime when they're, they're related to somebody. Like I was brought into a prison one time. I didn't even take a civil service test back in the 19, I think it was 1980. I was walked into the place, see if you like it for two weeks. If you do now, go take a civil service test. So it was all corrupt back then too. It was nepotism. Well, it was. It was just that way. And now, when, like, just look at this high school. It's 32% white and 68% minority. So it should be saying the white is the minority now. So we're going to hit a lot of issues like this, and even in hiring help. But you still have to hire the best help. It doesn't matter what their color is, hire the best help, especially when it comes to teachers. Cops and firemen, I agree with you. Hire neighborhood kids, hire some Spanish kids, good ones, put them in their neighborhood. That's going to help. But with education, we need the best. Thank you. Give it a I support the um, uh, the process that uh, create equal opportunity for uh, people either uh, in law or outside of law. Uh, as long as the uh, the candidate is the most qualified, then I will support the hiring. It doesn't matter if they know uh, anybody in, uh, who are related to someone in the city or not. Well, it sounds like that policy might be in for a change. Uh, candidate Marcia. Yes, I, I, well, I think the, uh, the nepotism policy, if anything, it, uh, I don't agree with it. It punishes, as uh, people like uh, Steve was saying, that, you know, generations of uh, people. My thing is, as long as they're qualified for the job and they're not just getting it because of a political phone call, then absolutely they should get the job and, and say, as long as they're qualified for it. And those phone calls never happen in this city, right? They don't happen anymore, right? <laughs> right, we'll move on to another question now. I'll, I'll pose this question to. Uh, Mr. Gignac, who's looking to get back onto the school committee. This will be our third question. Uh, Robert, on the upside, Lowell has its share of level one and level two schools. But up until recently, I think about 10 were listed as level three or non or non-performing, if I have the, uh, the lingo correct. What specific policy can a school committee member uh, pursue or try to initiate to reduce that number of level three schools? 
Well, the, the role of the school committee in this situation is to provide the resources to those struggling schools. And, and the school committee over the past few years has done a great job at that. Uh, look at the Merkland. They provided resources on top of resources, and they totally changed uh, the school dynamic. Um, <clears throat> as far as, uh, as a citywide policy or anything like that, uh, when I was on the school committee, I brought forward a motion to, to, to bring uh, forward some additional math coaches in some of the struggling schools that were sharing a math coach. And it was statistical, the statistics proved that uh, the schools with full-time math coaches were outperforming everyone across the city. Uh, my colleagues didn't support that. Um, no, well, I shouldn't say all of them, but a few of them didn't support my, my motion to bring new uh, math coaches. So that motion didn't pass? It did not. Well, to improve the schools, I just feel you got to look at a few of them, and I look at the Sullivan School, and then I try, I try to keep my eye on the Butler School because I feel those are the two that are having some issues. Year after year, I hear the same thing. So when I'm elected, I just would like to know why, and I, I think the best way is to talk to the teachers uh, and get a consensus. And out of that school, if you talk to them, what's, what's the issue? And get the answers out of teachers for the next two years on all policy, especially policy. We gotta let the teachers show us how to get out of this problem and they will. There's too many too many things are happening, the administration part of things that's affecting the classrooms. And it's a lot to do with discipline, bouncing kids from the Stocklosa because they can't do it in the Stocklosa, put them in the Butler. Uh, they can't do it at a certain school, send them to the Sullivan. And I'm confused because we have a lot of alternative schools and I'm wondering if they're all working right. I don't think they are. I think a few are. I never voted for them 20 years ago. I, don't, I was against them. Uh, but I know there's a few now that are working well. But I know there's some that aren't working. And I hope when I get on there, those are the questions I'm going to ask to improve it. But I'm going to ask teachers on all policy. Thank you. Gary Lee. I would uh, want to work uh, with superintendent uh, because he would know best uh, what to do with the schools that are underperformed. Uh, maybe he needs to talk to the principal of those schools and again and also teachers. Um, if uh, as a school committee uh, member, you could only uh, do so much. And uh, if 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 I need to uh, go out and and do something else. Uh, I would, but I would uh, prefer to uh, have the superintendent and, and the principals uh, to start uh, working on those issues. Thank you, Dennis. Yeah. I feel that uh, as a school committee member, if I'm uh, hard enough to get elected, uh, it's not really the role of the school committee to get involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the school department or the classrooms, but it is something we can instruct the superintendent that something needs to be done. Uh, one of the things is, uh, to my understanding, a few years ago there were some four and five level schools that actually went up high to ones and threes. What did they do to get to that one? Do we follow that policy? But it's up to the administration, it's up to the staff, the teachers to put together a plan and obviously, as uh, Robert said, we give them the resources they need to improve the schools. Thanks, Dennis. I think we have two more candidates to respond to this question. Andy and then Steve. Well, I uh, pretty much agree with everything that's been said so far. Uh, the school committee itself can't dictate how to make these come up with these solutions. Um, but I think that the superintendent and his assistants, um, along with the principals of the various schools that are having a difficult time, uh, should try to figure out where the shortcomings are, identify those, and address those so that they can succeed. Um, perhaps checking with the other schools that have had improve, improvements on their uh, MCAS scores. I think a combination of that, but as a school committee, I don't think we can intercede in, in terms of that, but like Bob said, providing the resources, yeah, that, we can make sure that happens, but, but all the rest comes from uh, the superintendent's office. So let's let the veteran respond here. <laughs> veteran. And Steve, these guys are taking themselves out of this committee. <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, one thing, one way to look at this, Chris, is as Dennis pointed out, is that a few years ago we had several level four schools um, that we've been able to promote up to level one schools 
In fact, Lowell, if you look at urban school districts across the state, we're the only urban to school district that doesn't have level four schools. Um, arguably, you could say that we're not, when it comes to uh, level rating, um, that we are the highest rated uh, school district in the, in, the, in the state when it comes to urban school districts. So in what we did to promote those level four schools higher is that the state provides uh, specific funding for that purpose. And we provide um, targeted training to the teachers and to the kids uh, in order to make that happen. So funding is what's necessary uh, to really improve those scores and bring those levels up. Because when you're talking about accountability levels, you're talking largely about MCAS scores. And there's so many factors that go into how kids score on MCAS. And in, a, in a, diverse, a diverse district like Lowell, we have so many challenges, we have newcomers, we have so many, uh, I think it's almost 30% English language learners uh, in the city of Lowell. So we're up against it when it comes to accountability levels. It's really not fair to compare Lowell's accountability level to some of the surrounding towns, for instance. But when you compare us to urban school districts, we're doing very well. So I think what we need to do is to try to duplicate some of those targeted training efforts that we did to bring up those level four schools uh, at the level three. And I think we've made good progress in the past couple of years, and I think that with more focus on that, and maybe some more funding, we can find a way to do it for the level three schools as well. Okay, Steve, thank you. I think that wraps it up on that question. So we'll mix it up a little bit here now, and, and I'm going to pose a few questions to you. I'll start with Andy on each question. Um, these are just yes or no yeah, answers. Yes, one might yes or no answers, okay? All right. Would you be in favor of prohibiting cell phone use by students during school hours? Would I be in favor of, of, of prohibiting? prohibiting? Of prohibiting? Yes. 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 All right, let's just say that just for a quick second, though. But is it feasible? Is it? I mean, like in the high school, there were three thousand something students. I'm not, it's feasible I'm not sure. It's, it just it back this way. I'm not sure it's workable. It'd be a very difficult thing to do, but it'd be a good policy to put in place and at least try to proceed from there with it. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Dominic. I feel the same way. We have to make a rule and and try to enforce it as much as we can. How about the prison guard? You must have Yeah, they're the going to get away with it no matter what you do. Even if you try to hide it, they'll hide it. So we just got to keep it under control and make sure. I mean, if they all had one, if everyone had an iPhone, it would be great. If everyone did. But they don't all have them because we could use them for education. But I, I, uh, I think it, we're better not use Okay, them. Robert. Thank you. Robert. Thank you. Actually, when the policy was proposed to change from, from no cell phones to cell phones, I, I voted against it. Uh, simply because I, I thought it would be a distraction in the classroom, and I, I would support going back to the old way. Thank you. Steve? Yeah, it is something that's definitely hard to enforce. I think we do have uh, systems in place to try to block, uh, you know, diff various social media outlets and so forth in some of the schools, but, you know, it doesn't always work, and I do think it's a distraction, uh, not only at school, but at home, doing homework <laughs> and all that kind of thing. So, so it is a real problem for this generation, and I think that uh, anything we can do uh, to put the focus back on education and learning uh, during school is a good thing. Thank you. And Andy? As a former educator, how many times I've had to tell the kids to put their phones away that I, c I can't even begin to tell you the number of times. So supporting no cell phones would definitely be on my docket. Okay, so that's good. I keep the mic. Should a new or renovated high school be kept in the downtown? I believe it should stay downtown. Pass the mic. Steve? Yes, I support the downtown location. Robert? Yes, I support the downtown location. I support it staying downtown. Downtown. <laughs> yes. Jeez, okay. All right, we'll stick with you, Dennis, on this one. Should teachers and administrators have a dress code? Oh, that's a good question. I wasn't even sure whether they did have one or not, but there should be a minimum dress code, yes. Thank you. Dominic? No. I think there should be some type of dress code, yes. Yes, I think a dress code is appropriate. Yes, I also support a dress code for okay. teachers and administrators. Yes, I do. Okay. Just, Dominic, why don't you feel there should be a dress code? I feel that, <coughs> excuse me, I feel that we do not need to uh, enforce the teachers to have dress codes because they are professionals and we should treat them as such. 
and uh, I I also believe that they they will uh, just appropriately for their job. Okay, okay. To, uh, keep the mic, Dominic. Uh, should school committee members earn a higher stipend and a higher annual stipend? You do the question. Should school committee members earn a higher annual stipend? Yes. Is it yes or no? Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes. Dennis? No. Robert? No. No. I'm okay with the stipend as it is. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you do this for the money. Okay, Steve. And Andy? I'm with Steve. Yeah. Okay. Andy, keep the mic. How would you grade A for excellent, F for failing, the school department's efforts to equip classrooms with the latest technology? C minus. It's not very encouraging, Steve. I'm going with a B on this. Uh, and can I? Can I? Yeah. Can let the others go. Then maybe we come back to it. Yeah, you talk to the chair of the technology yep. subcommittee. We'll come back. I have to a lot it. to say about this. Right. Robert. I'd also so give it a B. Um, I'll stick with the teacher. C minus. Okay. I'll just say a B. I'm going to stick with the chairman and B. Okay, well, we have a little bit of contrast here, so let the chairman of the technology subcommittee explain the grade. So we have a long way to go. Um, you know, as far as what, we're, what we have in the classroom now, maybe it is a C. Um, but I know that we've made great strides over the past couple of years to uh, bring more technology in. Uh, we have the uh, I iPad cards in all the schools now. A lot of the schools have dedicated classrooms with computers. Uh, but more importantly, we've updated the Wi-Fi. Maybe that's a bad thing for the social media thing, but all across the school district, uh, there's updated Wi-Fi here at the high school, is brand new Wi-Fi. And that's important if teachers want to be able to use the internet for lessons or have the kids interact through the internet. Um, and in addition to that, we were able to hire 11 tech, uh, techs uh, this past year that have made an amazing impact on the school system. Those techs, are they each have one or two schools, I mean two or three schools assigned to them, and they're able to quickly respond to any issues that come up. And if you talk to people about the response time, it's shot, it, it's gone way down, and everybody's happy with that. And it also allows the other employees to do what they're supposed to do, provide professional development to the teachers so that they know how to use the technology more. Okay, so I think we're doing great. Does anyone else want to touch on this subject? Are we good? All right, we'll move on to, um, to the next question. I think it goes to Mr. Hoey this time around. Andy, can you pass the mic on to Robert? So Robert, when it comes to standardized testing, what are your general thoughts about standardized testing? And do you prefer the MCAS test or do you prefer the PARC test that has been talked about a lot lately in the media? Well, I'm not a big fan of any testing. I think we waste a lot of time teaching to the test. And I just think when a teacher has a master's degree in a classroom, they know how to teach, and uh, they shouldn't have to be doing that. But there are state mandates. I would stick with MCAS. The, uh, the benefit of uh, having part from what I understood is that uh, uh, there are multiple testing for teachers to, uh, to evaluate the students. Uh, but I am not a fan of having so many tests for the students. Um, so I, and, and to go to park, you have to retrain, and there are a lot of preparation uh, before uh, we can start doing the, the testing. And so I prefer uh, MCAS. Thank you, John. Dennis? I'm not as strong, uh, but as uh, uh, Bob said, it's because the teachers to teach just for the test, they should have some more leeway. Uh, it, it is mandated by the state, so obviously we have to do it. and. Uh, you know, if anything, uh, you know, stick with the MCAS. It's a it's a system that's in place. The teachers are familiar with it. Uh, and, you know, we should involve the teachers more in those kind of things. All right, sir. Thank you. Can we get the mic down here to Andy? Um, excuse me. I believe we should stay with MCAS. Um, it's a tried and true, and it's probably an end. Obviously. Uh, Commissioner Chester uh, has come out in, in favor of staying with MCAS as opposed to PARC. Uh, there were 27 states that actually had signed on to PARC, and now they're down to only six or seven states, which is a telling statement in my book. And it would be prohibitive, cost prohibitive, 
to implement the testing with, with PARC, uh, something that I think Superintendent Franco had once said was going to cost the district about $19 million to get to where we have to be to, in order to, to uh, provide that test to our kids. So I think we should stay with them, Cass. Okay, Andy, thank you. Steve? So unfortunately, standardized testing is a necessary evil. We need to be able to measure ourselves and rate our, our performance. Uh, that said, we need to be careful about just teaching to the test. You know, we can't have teachers just focusing on the test. We need them to have the freedom to be creative in their education and in the education of the kids. I support MCAS. I had uh, a motion on the floor last night that passed unanimously uh, having the school committee stand in opposition to implementing the PARC test. I feel as though Massachusetts across the country has been the highest rated in education for many years, or at least in the top few uh, when it comes to education ratings. Uh, we've done that by using MCAS. PARC is a nationally standardized test. I feel it's going to be a watered down version of the MCAS, and I think that we uh, deserve to have our own standard um, because I feel as though uh, we're going to be drawn down. As Andy pointed out, 26 states signed on originally, we're down to seven. As I said in the, as I was quoted saying in the sun this morning, why would we get on that train when the ship is sinking? It's kind of a mixed metaphor, but you get my point. <laughs> and kid of the kick Thank you. I too uh, would oppose the implementation of PARC. I, I support the idea of MCAS. I support using it as a measurement tool. Um, but as, as all of my colleagues up here have mentioned, uh, putting uh, the emphasis on having teachers teach those tests is really a disservice. Uh, it's the teacher's job to really have a well-rounded student and provide them a well-rounded education. And, and forcing these tests down their throats is really a, a, is not the productive way to go. Uh, and the park, I, I commend Mr. Jen for bringing that motion forward last night because the, the park test, would, the, the school district actually tested it out and it, it was not successful and many other school di districts across the state have tested it out and it's just, it's a real drain on the system. You know, you've all touched on, just staying on this topic for a second, uh, you've all touched on teaching to the test and you're concerned about teachers losing their creativity or their ability to work with the students that we have to teach to the test. Do you think in Lowell uh, that's generally what's happening or do teachers still have that creativity and that leeway to do that? You can just stay with that. And just sure, I think the, the, the room for creativity is really, really limited with all of the testing. Uh, I'd like to see some more freedom in the classroom, but I think it's, it's not just Lowell, it's across the Commonwealth. Robert? Yeah, I just feel the mandates are bogging down the teachers and uh, the paras are the ones doing the physical job with students and uh, the paras are getting paid less than a CNA, in, in my opinion, in a year. So uh, until we increase their money, and I think we're going to have to increase the parents' money to improve that whole area because the teachers are buried on a computer keeping up with mandates. So that's my answer. Thanks. Thank you, Dominic. I, I still believe that <coughs> the teacher, excuse me, the teacher do have time for creativity. However, because of the requirement uh, and the pressure to uh, for performance on on testing, the teacher uh, have to take a lot of time to prepare for that. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not sure how much time in a day the teacher has to, you know, for uh, free teaching and creativity. If, um, you know, obviously from talking to teachers that they need more time for that. So, you know, if there's a way of uh, squeezing it in there, but um, like everybody said, you know, they have to, it's mandated, they have to make sure the tests are all taken and all that. But I think the more creativity they have, the better. Thank you. Andy and then Steve? I agree with all my colleagues so far. Um, in, in fact, the level and t amount of time that's being allowed to, for that creativity keeps shrinking because, again, they're always trying to get these kids to be able to pass these tests. Um, so, so little Johnny has to be brought out and working with MCAS help here, and then Mary has to be taken out on this particular time. So. Uh, you know, she's losing or he's losing that precious classroom time with the teacher. Um, so, again, I think we are putting way too much weight on these standardized tests because uh, we are testing our kids to death, truly. Having been here for such a long time, there are sometimes when they're in a month, sometimes there'll be four tests being administered. 
It's it's absolutely there's crazy. very little you can do. Correct? Nope. Yeah, they're all mandated. Steve, teachers are under tremendous pressure now to to uh, achieve in the MCAS, and as a result, their time for creativity, as, as Dominic said, is keep being squeezed. Uh, but it still goes on, and creative teachers find a way to get it done. I just came from the farm to school kickoff at the Bartlett School uh, with Mill City Gross, where they have the community gardens out there. We have community gardens at eight schools now, and we're looking to do five more uh, this year. And they use those gardens uh, for math lessons, for English lessons, they use them for science lessons. A math teacher got up and said, you can do an algebra lesson using these gardens. You can do an English lesson using these gardens, and obviously you can do a science lesson. Not only that, it gives socialization to the kids. The kids love it, they'll get in their hands in the dirt. A lot of these kids have never farmed anything in their lives. So um, it's, a, it's a really great program, and it's one way where teachers can be more creative about their lessons. Well, that's encouraging. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions before closing statements. Dominic, the next question will go to you. Steve, could you pass the mic down, please? So all of you earlier touched on the new superintendent. Now is the opportunity to do it. So Dominic, based on what you've seen so far with the new superintendent, Mr. Kalfawi, how do you think he's doing? And do you pledge to support him if you were elected? If elected, from what I've heard about him and the, from what I uh, know of, of what he has been doing so far, he has been uh, doing a, a good job. Uh, I have not heard of uh, any complaint. Uh, so I, I will support him as of now. I haven't heard of anything bad yet. I, uh, I actually had the pleasure of meeting uh, with the superintendent a little while ago. I called him up. He got a call right back. I think probably everybody else did. And I found him very, uh, very intelligent, very passionate about his job. He's very community oriented. And uh, with what's been going on so far, what I've seen of him, I would absolutely support him. Thank you, Dennis. We'll come down here to Andy, and then I think we have time for one more question, so Dennis, you can be first on the next question. Andy. Well, I firmly believe we have to back him up because it's a win-win. If, if he wins, our kids win, and we're here for them. So it, it, we definitely have to support him. And I have been hearing very good, positive um, pieces of information. I'm not, I'm not working in Central, so it's hard to know, but I'm, I'm hearing a lot of positive things. So I think when well, we did our superintendent search this past year, uh, I thought Dr. Calfau was one of the candidates that could have um, been chosen for the job. Obviously, I didn't uh, support him and vote for him at the time. Uh, but since then, I've made an effort to uh, reach out to him, get to know him. He's been at my house for dinner. Um, and I'm very, very uh, satisfied with what I see in Dr. Kelfow. I think he's a very intelligent man. I, ver I very much like his calm demeanor. He's one of these people that uh, never gets too high, never gets too low. He's just even keel. And I think that's really important in a district like Lowell uh, to have somebody at the helm who has the knowledge, has the experience, and has that even keel. So I'm very happy with Dr. Kelfow. And you envision supporting him? And I do and I intend to support him, yes. Do you think he'll make it past three years? That, I think so, Chris. I mean, he might be the man. Robert? Thank you. I, too, had the opportunity to meet with the superintendent a few weeks ago. Uh, and we had a, a long discussion about his vision for the district. And what really impressed me was his, his development of a long-term plan. And that's he's, he's bringing in stakeholders from all over the community to really develop a plan. And I think it's very important to have a school committee that want, is going to be a part of that support system to make that plan a reality. Thank you. And Robert Hoey? I'm not sure. I, I never met the man yet, uh, but I did sit with a school committee before, and I didn't like the su superintendent of schools at the time when I first got there, George Sapposavis. But then after working with him, I think for a minute who that was. I get after, after working with him and finding out what he was all about and how hard of a worker he was and the vision he had for the old schools, I'm the one that brought a motion to give him a three-year contract extension. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, give the microphone to Dennis, please. Last question, then we'll do closing statements. Uh, one more time. For closing. Just do the closing statements. Closing statements. Dennis, why don't you take it away? Okay, well, my name is uh, Dennis Mercier, and I'm a candidate for the Lowell School Committee. I'm a lifelong resident of Lowell. I've uh, always been involved in public service and, uh, in one way or another. As uh, 17 and 18 years, I've been our vice chairman of the Lowell Cemetery Commission. I was on a community team work board. Uh, growing up in my family, you always learned about public service and uh, you know, giving back to the community. At a time in my life where I had the time to do that and a uh, passion for the city. 
and have hopefully uh, respectfully ask for one of the six votes for the Lowell School Committee. We we'll just go down the line, Dominic. My name is Dominic Lay. I am number nine on the ballot. I, as a member of the community, I humbly, humbly ask for one of your six votes for the school committee on November 3rd. Uh, my background is uh, in math and techno in information technology and uh, small business ownership. Uh, our children, uh, our school children, will be the future of our. Um, our city, and uh, I would like to take part of uh, uh, making sure that uh, we have the safe and helpful and happy learning environment for every one of them. Uh, and again, I humbly ask for one of your six votes uh, for those school committees so I can be a bridge to uh, uh, between you, the community, the community, and our school so we can do it together. Thank you. Candidate Paul Poey. Okay, thank you. 20 years ago I was on your school committee and I like to get consensus. That's what I like to do. I like to ask teachers for everything. I changed the age requirements of children entering the school by six months. And what I did was I put a motion on the table and I told Superintendent Sattler Savas to go ask the teachers, uh, kindergarten, pre-K, first graders, ask those teachers should we change the age requirements. It came back, I forget the number, it's 20 years ago, but it came back like 110 to 4. So it passed with flying colors. So right now I'm just asking for one of your six votes, November 3rd. Uh, I was on a school committee that created this movie studio, that created the Latin Lyceum, K. Stock Loser, Regina Fatacante, Judge Kula Harris, Bill Tobia, myself, and Timmy Golden. I'm very proud of what I did back then, and I think I continue. I could continue to serve all the children in Lowell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin Pop Gignan. Thank you. Thank you to the Lowell Sun and those of you that are here watching us tonight. Uh, my name is Robert Gignac, and I'm, I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Lowell and a proud product of the Lowell Public Schools. Uh, Two years ago, I had the opportunity to represent you on the Lowell School Committee, and during that time, we were able to make tremendous strides in the district. And I'm truly proud of what we were able to accomplish. Uh, this is an exciting time for the Lowell Public Schools. We have a new uh, superintendent and a new school committee coming aboard, and I'd like to be a part of the team to really develop the future of the Lowell Public Schools. So I respectfully ask for your vote on November 3rd. Thank you, candidate for re-election, Steve Jenner. Yes, thanks to the Sun for sponsoring the event, all of you for being down here, and every, anybody who takes the time to watch this. Uh, I've been involved in local government in one way or another for more than 20 years now. I do it because it's my way to give back to the community that's given so much to me and my family. I've worked really hard over the past two years as your representative on the Lowell School Committee. I've visited all of our schools. I've met with every single principal. I've met with dozens of teachers and students. I focused on my priorities of quality education, community service, and driving the effort to build a new Lowell High School. I believe I'm better qualified, better prepared than anybody to represent you for the next two years, and I respectfully ask for your vote. Thanks, and if you want to learn more, go to my website, steveforlowell.com. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. And candidate Andy Dakota. Hi, I'm Andy Dakota, and I am running for school committee. Um, I have just recently retired after 40 years of being a teacher, and uh, 23 of of them in here in the city. Uh, I, my two sons graduated from Lowell High School. Uh, I am a very, very integral part of our uh, city. Uh, I'm a choir director in the city as well, and I want to continue to work with the kids and for the kids. Uh, so I thought, what better way to do it than to go on to the school committee? So I appreciate one of your votes on November 3rd. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. And I guess that wraps up the first panel. Thank you all for participating. Thank you for watching at home and get out to vote on November 3rd. We'll take a short break before we bring the next six candidates.